Before we start the episode, I would like to emphasize that Mokale Klopeng's connection has been very, very poor in this uh, interview. And we had to switch between Zoom and computer and phone and WhatsApp. And uh, it has been very challenging. Nevertheless, we all decided to go on as we consider that the topic we discussed and what Mokale had to say was very meaningful and important. And we decided to keep some of those parts in the actual podcast to emphasize the fact that something as simple as a proper internet connection in a place like Zambia can be very, very challenging sometimes. So without further ado, enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Key Culture Podcast. This is Matej Georgiou, and as always, I'm co-hosting this with... Nilo Tarnanen. Welcome, everybody. Nice Hello. to see you. Hello, Nilo. And today we have a special day. We have two guests we have never met before. We have Mokale Koapeng. Hello. Hello. And we have uh, Shirley Apthorpe. Hi. Hello. And nice to be here. Nice to, be, uh, to meet you. And they're both from South Africa. Uh, we want to continue our, our, let's say, discovery of the rest of the world. Uh, we have already done a few episodes about that. It's, it is important for us in this season to try to see what happens in other places than Europe. We know a lot about uh, European music, uh, somewhat about uh, North American music, but we don't know what's happening in other places like the Middle East, the Far East, South America, Africa. And today we're going to talk with two people from South Africa. So Shirley is an opera critic and music journalist, and she's a director of Umkolo. This is, Shirley, if you can explain, this is a production company, right? Yes, uh, Umtola has been running for a bit more than 10 years. Um, We are a collaboration between Germany and South Africa, and we are making music theatre in townships uh, with local communities, uh, bringing opera out of the opera house and into everyday life. Great. And uh, Mokale is a a teacher and conductor and composer. And uh, right now he's actually teaching in Zambia at... uh, Rusangu University. Did I get that right? You got it right, yes. Great. All right. So um, let's let's just uh, dive in directly to the discussion. Just uh, very briefly, tell us about yourself, something that I haven't managed to explain. Uh, So let's start with uh, Mokale. Hi, my name is Mokale Kwapeng. Uh, as explained, you know, I'm originally from South Africa. That's where I grew up, born and grew up and got my, you know, all my musical training and experience. Um, I studied music, you know, uh, in, in several, you know, community organizations. And after my high school uh, education, I went to uh, the, one of our local universities, Wales University. Um, And after graduation, I worked as a a music teacher, a performer, composer. Um, Yeah, that's largely, you know, my my experience. I've worked with choirs and and, and a lot of community organizations. Yes. All right. How about Shirley? Um, Yes, as you can perhaps hear from my accent, I actually grew up in Australia. Um, I was born in Cape Town, but my parents emigrated in the evil 1970s, which was a difficult time for South Africa. Um, And I started returning to my home country after I had moved from Australia to Germany. So I I now live in Berlin, uh, where I've been working internationally for for the last couple of decades. Um, And I had the idea of bringing my European network back home to South Africa. Um, Mokali and I have been collaborating for some time now and uh, our most significant partnership was when we worked together on a production, a staged production of Bach's St. John's Passion in Soweto. Um, 
which was yeah for, for me certainly one of the highlights of oh. of my musical adulthood i have to say <laughs> yeah. so so weto is one of the suburbs of johannesburg did i understood correctly well uh, if you say suburb in in south africa suburbs uh, denote uh, a certain class, you know, so it's, you know, normally, you know, we, we, we call it a township, uh, okay. which is a place largely populated by, 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 you know, people of African origins. Yeah. So it is a, it's an acronym for Southwestern Township, which is a, a geographical location within the Southern, South, Southwestern part of, of Johannesburg. Yes. Right. Let's get to the, let's say, the hot potato of the, or one of them of the discussion. So I've also always been thinking about this, that Africa is a large continent. And despite this, we in Europe don't know much at all about music in Africa. Uh, we rarely hear of classical musicians coming from this continent. Yet, uh, uh, if we do encounter musicians coming from uh, Africa, they often come from South Africa, from the country of South Africa. Why is that? Let's uh, ask, for example, Mokale. Well, um, you know, something interesting, uh, I think around the 90s, uh, beginning of the 90s and when South Africa got its, its uh, independence or, you know, a, a new democracy, um, the world, is it okay? Oh, yeah, I've stretched my hand, yeah. Now I was saying that in the yeah in the nineties early nineties you know just uh, before and at the beginning of, of of the new democratic order in South Africa, the 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 Western world um, saw South Africa and South Africa also positioned itself as the so called gateway into into Africa. Um, for instance, if you come if you go if we are from Europe and you want to go to Zimbabwe, Botswana. Zambia, Mozambique, and all that. You have to go to South Africa first, uh, then connect to your, your final de destination, other countries in the southern and uh, you know a part of, of the continent. So the the uh, folk, like I said, focus has largely been on on, on South Africa, and uh, even other you know countries in in Africa. Uh, those who cannot go to 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 Europe, for instance. They, they would actually, their second choice would be, would be South Africa. That's why you find a lot of Africans in, 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 in South Africa. Let's ask the same from, uh, from Shirley also. So why is it that always, if, if they're classical musicians, they're coming from South Africa and in general from Africa, we don't get to see or hear about any classical musicians? Well, I, th I think Makali has just explained um, very well that South Africa has for a long time functioned as a kind of gateway within the African continent so that um, musicians from other countries who want to study uh, might go to South Africa before they go to Europe. So uh, when we think of South African musicians, they are often musicians from other African countries who've, who've studied in South Africa. I'm thinking, for instance, now of Angela Kerrison, who's an opera singer from Botswana, who studied in Cape Town. Um, Mokali could list many more. I do think we've been aware of Congolese musicians, thanks not least to Alain Platel in Belgium, uh, who's brought a lot of people through his company to Europe. Um, and the work of someone like Brett Bailey, um, whose company Third World Bunfight has toured productions like Macbeth and Exhibit B controversially throughout the world. And he's also brought musicians from many African countries um, with his productions, but maybe we only think of him as a South African artist. And I think Mokali's point is um, South Africa has become a catch-all for, for musicians who've studied in South Africa or musicians who are traveling through South Africa. Um, if you look closer, the picture is bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about this, like Mokale said, that uh, it used to be like uh, South Africa was a gate to Europe, but I mean, hasn't the world changed since then? Like, um, uh, isn't 
uh, is this how it still works or or it it has kind of remained like that or is it changing at this point mukala's connection already became so bad that i will try to summarize what he said he wanted to name two musicians that he found very important for the public to know both are Ghanaians with american uh, citizenship one is william chapman Nyaho, who is a concert pianist specializing in performances of pieces by African composers or composers with African descent. And the other is Ghanaian born uh, out of Nigerian parents, who is called Fred Onovueros Woke, very hard to pronounce, who is a composer. Mokale went on further to say that uh, the situation is indeed changing, also because South Africa has all sorts of economic problems, and Nigeria is coming pretty hard from behind to establish itself as a significant economic power in Africa. And Rwanda is also somewhat coming strong in her own region. So it is expected that the situation will not remain as it is which is that Africa, uh, South Africa is a gateway for all the, the rest of the continent. That, that sounds like a good goal, that uh, through the uh, change in the uh, dynamics and, and, and the growing economics, you might see also the other countries flourishing and, and producing more musicians and, and, and music to the yes. world also. How would you describe the music life in South Africa in general? Uh, like, what are the cities or the institutions that the music world is uh, revolving around, and what are the most popular styles or genres of music in South Africa? Yeah. All right. Yeah. No. Uh, the, the 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 South African music industry, um, it's it's as it is right now. It's largely dominated by by what 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 we can call the youth culture, where you have uh, a strong dominance of of rap and hip hop uh, and you know at some point you know the, it was the local version of those two was called Kwaito. Um, so I, I never get to know the difference well I do I can hear the difference but you know uh, to me I, I normally refer to them as one thing but anyway so that represents that youth culture uh, and the club culture um, and you know it happens in a lot of clubs. At some point, there were you know festivals. Um, there was the notion of uh, fill fill up the dome or fill up F and B, where you'd have a popular artist uh, single-handedly filling up a ten thousand seater you know a, a, a venue. So that's quite popular. Then um, the other you know a popular. Sex, you know, uh, section is is your your jazz scene, um, where you have quite a number of, of of companies showing interest in supporting and having festivals, supporting festivals coming in as, as sponsors. You know, uh, for instance, you know, I mentioned the the, the Standard Bank uh, Jazz Festival, which happens in Sentin City in Johannesburg. And the Cape Town, the, the Cape Town International Jazz Festival, which at some point was associated with the North Sea Jazz Festival. Then you have, uh, you know, um, now Johannesburg, being the the, the 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 economic capital of the country, obviously with all the uh, or major companies headquartered there, um, and you know major international. A major you know, record labels you know, stationed there uh, has that pool or you know um, attracting most musicians uh, so you'd find that you know a, a musician a popular musician from some rural part of, of South Africa or Cape Town or you know would actually want to come to you know, to Johannesburg because that's where record companies are uh, and you know record companies make uh, the careers of popular music, you know, uh, thrive. So it ha Johannesburg has that natural pool. But um, there are other, you know, uh, cities like Cape Town, which is quite an, an, a, a, a serious 
competitor with Johannesburg in terms of economics and, 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 and culture is another important uh, space for, you know, for culture. Then have, uh, which is quite an, an interesting uh, phenomenon, a, 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 a town like uh, Ma, you know, uh, Makanda, which was formerly called the, the uh, uh, formerly called Grahamstown, hosting what is called the National Arts Festival with a huge sponsorship from Standard Bank Arena, which is, I mean, Standard Bank, which is one of the top five you know, banks in South Africa, in partnership with government. Um, you know, that little town, it's a, it's a small town hosting a, a national uh, festival, which at some point, I'm not sure if that's the case now, at some point was regarded as the second biggest in the world after Edinburgh. You know, I, I'm, wow. I'm, yes, it, it's quite interesting. It's, it's one of the smallest towns in, in, in South Africa, yet hosting uh, 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 the second biggest uh, you know, in, international festival in, in, in the world. That's an interesting you know, dynamic. Then, um, then you have you know, the, the, the choral music sector which is a subsection of, of the broader you know, classical you know, music with the uh, choral music sector, which is very popular amongst you know, a, a black people, which is also a vehicle for, for most singers to get into the opera world. Uh, you'll find that current uh, opera singers, black opera singers who are you know, in, in all parts of, of the world or opera centers in the world, uh, you'll trace that they, are, they have choral beginnings. They started in, in school choirs or church choirs or community choirs, uh, then developed interest in opera, then they'll go for training and find most you would find themselves in Europe. So that's an, a significant you know, uh, area. Then classical music, um, you know, orchestral music, um, there are three, well, the three centers, you know, the uh, Cape Town, Johannesburg, and, and Deben representing the three you know, uh, provinces. But I think another important you know, uh, area would be Bloemfontein. Most people you know, would ignore that, but there is something quite interesting happening in, 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 in Bloemfontein. Yeah, so that uh, is you know, a, a broader, much broader picture of, 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 of the music scene in, in, in South Africa. So, Obvious. so there you have be within that, yeah, yes. So you have three cities that have symphony orchestras or you have three symphony orchestras or you have more, how is it? Uh, there, there are the main, yeah, it's, it's actually three cities that have symphony orchestras. It's Cape Town, Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, then the Johannesburg Philharmonic Orchestra and the KZN KwaZulu-Natal Philharmonic Orchestra. And these two Johannesburg and KwaZulu-Natal Philharmonic Orchestra, they are under one management. They have the uh, one CEO. So. Uh, I don't I know how he does it, but anyway, that's the, yeah. Uh, so, so those are the ones. But I know that uh, Bloemfontein does have a, a symphony orchestra. It might right. not be as, as professional and as strong as Cape Town, Johannesburg, and uh, Deben, yes. Mm, this is really interesting. It sounds like the South Africa doesn't only have diversity in terms of really many uh, equally strong musical approaches or styles, but also uh, many cities or, 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 or even smaller towns that are um, important yeah. in terms of the music life. This sounds like it, it's a good situation for, for diversity and having many voices. Is it, is it really so? Uh, 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 Shelley, would you want to add something before I say? I think you've given a really good overview, Mokale, um, and and I I totally agree that it's a it's a flourishing ground for diversity. Um, always dogged by the problem of basic survival because there just is not enough funding for for all of those things. But maybe you can explain that in more depth, Mokale. Yeah, um, yeah. Just just you know to respond to Nilo's question, I I, I think. For me, that should be an exciting uh, a dynamic. The fact that you have smaller uh, uh, towns like you know, Makanda uh, hosting a, a, a huge festival 
like I said, second biggest in, in, in the world. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but at some point that uh, you know, we used to hear that, you know, that that was the case. Uh, is an interesting thing, and it shows the potential that small towns have in terms of, of hosting. And um, well, the other thing that I forgot was you know, the, the element of indigenous music, which largely happens in, in rural communities. But an interesting dynamic is that uh, some of those indigenous music styles and practices, you will still find them in, 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 in urban spaces because of the migration of you know, labor, labor migration, you know, the hostile situations, you know, um, with people coming from, from, from rural areas, when they get into a, a city center, they would put together, you know, you know, groups from their own communities, then perform dances, music from, from rural spaces in, in urban areas. And I've actually interacted and worked with some of um, such, such, such groups. It's a very interesting a, a dynamic. Yes, you are right, Nilo. It should be something that that gives South Africa a, a um, you know, a, make, make it you know quite dynamic and and diverse. You know, where you have everything for everybody. You know, but Shelley will 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 I hope will will agree with me is, is that the government does not have you know does not support. Uh, 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 those events, you know, to strengthen those communities and entities. Because if if there was a concerted effort from government to support, and and I I think all sectors of the community would would actually thrive, and um, that, that that would help in terms of creating a, a a very viable, you know, cultural industry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you you raised very many points, uh, and I. <laughs> We're going to talk also about the economic aspect because we're also very interested in that. I was just, while you were talking, I was remembering the podcast we had with a, a very nice guest from Ghana a few weeks ago who was describing somewhat similar aspects that th th they don't have enough money, uh, they don't have government support to, to do, uh, to let's say, to improve the musical situations. And he, he there explained that there's different parts of the musical life, the indigenous music, the choral, choral music also, and there's some band music and of course pop and, and so on. And he, when I talk, we talked about Western music, a few reasons why he said that it doesn't connect to the so much, I mean, that Ghana doesn't have a rich, let's say Western music tradition. There were a couple of reasons. While one was economic, two was that the white European population pretty much left from there, and uh, they didn't mix at all with the black population. So it didn't like uh, so classical music was not played in anybody's house. So it was not like a, there was not time to make any kind of cultural exchange. So very few of the black people from Ghana were listening to classical music because they liked it. So. Would it be a stretch to say that uh, is it because in South Africa there is still, let's say, a significant white population that you have, let's say, that Western music has remained significant or it has nothing to do with it? No, 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 no. I, I, I think it's largely because of, of that. Look, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. I mean, we, South Africa has, has a white population. But in addition to that, it has a, a, a significant uh, number of, of non-white, you know, uh, I'm not using it in a historical term, but I'm just, you know, in a descriptive you know, manner, uh, a, a significant group of people who are not of white uh, or European descent, I think. Yes, yeah, yes. Who have studied, you know, a classical music and uh, are, are in, in these orchestras that I've mentioned, I'm one of, of the, the people who studied classical music. My, my training is, is in Western classical music, but I developed, as I grew up, I developed interest in indigenous music because my home was not, you know, is not very far from, from a, 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 a male a hostel where I experienced, you know, a, a, a traditional dancing. And uh, at some point I got exposed to Zulu dancing. My friend, uh, that you know, uh, you, uh, uh, my teenage friend 
his brother had a lot of jazz records on Sundays. We listened to jazz. So even though my class, my training is classical, but I developed other other styles. And a lot of young people, you know, tend to 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 appreciate a lot. So um, it's yes, the presence of 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 significant presence of of of, of whites in South Africa. Uh, blacks also developing, you know, uh, and participating in in and getting educated in in that kind of music. Yeah. So the the the, the, the in Ghana it might be different because they did not interact in South Africa even be, before the advent of of the new democracy. There there were a number of whites who interacted with blacks, you know, during apartheid. Who who you know I, I studied classical music right at the height of oppression. Shelley mentioned 1970s, which was a horrible period. So, you know, was the, the 1980s, you know, and that's when most of us studied, you know, classical music. So there is a, you are right, but the dynamics might be different, you know, per country. Um, perhaps later then I would sort of give insights as to my observations about classical music in Zambia. Yeah, we could do that later. Could then, Lily, did you have a point? Yeah, I would yeah. Be interested to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to you, Makali, for that, for that description. I'd just like to add um, that that the musical life in South Africa is this interesting um, legacy of a deeply troubled past. Um, uh, for instance, part singing was introduced by missionaries. Um, yeah. But it became embraced by African singers as their own and transformed into something uh, new. Um, similarly, the symphony orchestras uh, were uh, part of the apartheid structures, which which provided fully funded um, opera, ballet and theatre companies in all the big cities. And they were by whites and for whites. Um, and so when democracy came, in the early 1990s, um, there were there were troubled institutions, and and that that stink still clings to the architecture of the buildings, and and um, you know that you you have this beautiful thing which is a symphony orchestra, uh, which was created uh, as part of this truly unjust oppressive structure, and then what do you do with it? And the issue of transformation is one which which is. Um, well, it occupies the entire country, but naturally also classical music. The anomaly was that um, the black community was singing um, and right. not only singing uh, church music, uh, that they also were singing oratorios, Handel's Messiah was being performed in Zulu already in the 19th century. Um, and then the community embraced opera music, uh, which is also something that came within the community. So you, you had all the component parts of opera without the symphony orchestra, which is the bit that costs money and that belonged to the white community. Um, and that's still reflected in, in many ways in the musical landscape in South Africa. Of course, instrumental music has been transforming. So as Mokali says, there are, there are really great black instrumentalists now in the symphony orchestras. Um, but overall, it's still harder for children growing up in black townships to have access to instrumental training because that costs money. Um, and what used to be a, a fundamental injustice based on skin color is now a fundamental justice, injustice based on income. Income, yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And there have been some wonderful projects like Buscade in Soweto by Rosemary Norton, like uh, Bacciabella Strings, um, Macaulay will know many more um, projects to redress that imbalance, but it, it's somehow partly still a drop in the in the ocean. Um, and and what happened then, of course, was that the old apartheid structures got defunded, um, and some of the orchestras inevitably went under. And uh, those structures continue to struggle to go bankrupt and then get reborn in a new hat. Orchestral musicians now. I don't think that goes for many places in the world. There have to be freelancers. There have to be portfolio musicians who, who survive in a gig economy because uh, there's not sufficient political will for a fully funded symphony orchestra. Um, but you can't have opera without a symphony orchestra. And that is no, the, of course not. That is the weird divide. You have this gulf between the people who are practicing opera, which is a huge community passion. You know, I, I, I remember Neo Mayanga, who's a fellow 
composer of Mokale's um, saying at a conference in Berlin that if you went to some rural areas of South Africa and told the kids who are singing Mozart and Rossini and Puccini and Verdi as an absolute matter of course, if you told them white people also sing opera, they'd look at you like you were crazy. <laughs> this is really interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At this point, Mokale's connection was completely lost and we will only get him back later through WhatsApp which had its own problems uh, with a lot of sounds coming from somewhere else. But uh, nevertheless, Shirley is going to try now to answer the question that was supposed to be for Mokale from Nilo, which is whether the choral tradition in church had anything to do with South Africa becoming such a big singing nation. Um, I can fill in a bit um, saying that, that South Africa was always a singing nation and people have always used song to sell, tell stories and song to communicate. And traditionally people sang together, um, but it was more like a traditional monody. And the idea of part singing of four part harmony is something that, that uh, was brought in by the colonizers, but uh, ad adopted and adapted by local populations. Can I ask, like, because uh, I had an also a follow-up question with with regards to something else. So, so like now, from what I understand, there is like a very let's say diverse community of classical musicians that are both white and black in uh, the or symphony orchestras among the singers. But uh, let's say in the seventies, it used to be like that they, they were all white, right? So. Did I, so all the classical music was done by white people only then, or how, how was it? No, actually it's, it's a little more complicated than that. So the, the government funded whites only structures where, ah. where um, white symphony orchestras played for white audiences, um, but there was still music happening in the, in the black communities. There were key community leaders who were doing pioneering work. Um, and there was, a, a, I mean, and also apartheid um, wasn't there from the beginning. So you, you had a period where there was segregation, but not apartheid. And um, in this time in Cape Town, the Eon group was born, um, I think in the 1950s. Um, the, the Eon group was colored musicians, musicians of color, in Cape Town singing opera. Um, and th they were founded in the 1950s and uh, continued in one form or another right up until today. Um, the theater where they performed still stands in the, the suburb of Athlone, which is traditionally a colored suburb in, in South Africa. And it's it's important to, to explain that in South Africa, we talk about black and colored populations um, which were historically quite different things and they remain communities which self-identify um, differently. So the colored population was a population um, that grew from mixed race descent, um, which included people from um, East, Southeast Asia who were brought over by the slave trade, um, frequently Muslim, not always. Um, and so yeah, in indigenous uh, uh, Bushmen uh, who, who were sometimes raped by white settlers um, and their offspring under subsequent governments became categorized as, as a separate thing, neither black nor white, more privileged than the black, less privileged than the white. They had access to some more education than the black population. It was very, very perverse. Mm -hmm. um, also geographically, if, if you look at Cape Town, um, you have the white city center, then an industrial belt, then the colored uh, population, then another industrial belt, and then the black settlements. Um, and that that um, is also reflected by the theatres. So the Athlone uh, Joseph Stone Theatre was the coloured community theatre and also the home to the Eon Group, who who performed opera um, despite apartheid through the difficult years. Um, and and uh, there have always been outstanding composers and singing teachers in the black community who uh, claimed music as, as their right, their birthright 
despite the fact that apartheid made access so much more difficult. But do I understand correctly that um, that the instrumental music that um, the black or colored communities didn't have as good um, access to the instrumental music because the instruments were expensive and there was a great inequality in terms of, of economic resources. Yes, so not only the, segregation. Not only the instruments, but also tuition. Um, yes. And with that comes a really interesting area of music literacy. Um, the black choral community developed its own form of music literacy, which is called tonic solfa. Uh, that's a bit like um, Kodai, um, mm -hmm. the do re mi system, but do is movable um, and it has its own notation. And uh, even today, the, the choir competition repertoire is published in so-called dual notation. So there's Western notation uh, and the text and the text is annotated with the tonic solfa symbols. Um, and so a lot of the community will read tonic solfa rather than Western notation. And that it was a kind of interim tool which gave people access to, um, to their own form of musical literacy in a way of recording and passing on circulating that didn't require um, the same publishing, the same education level, maybe. I, I think that could be contested, but um, yeah, it, it's this parallel universe of, of an own notation that belongs to the choir world. Mm, that would be really interesting. You know, though, I mean, this, this is so, um, so much a part of, I know you're struggling with it, but it yeah. really, um, it, it is representative of the challenges facing the communities. Um, right, right. The, the basic okay. infrastructure of bandwidth, which, you know, these days almost feels like a human right, uh, is, is just not there. And, and data is expensive. So, you know, I'm working at the moment with the Royal Opera House who have Engender, which is a program for women in opera. Um, and I'm trying to, they're saying, oh, let's do things on Zoom. And I'm trying to explain for Zoom, you need data and data is expensive. Right. Um, you know, I, for, for quite some time, I wondered why the young people that I work with um, on music projects, who, who many of them stay in touch, I think they're all insomniacs, you know, why do I only hear from them after midnight? Do, do these kids just not sleep at all? Uh, until someone explained to me, yes, data is cheaper after midnight. So the only time these kids can afford to go online is is um, is after midnight, uh, and it's 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 you know you need to to understand the fundamental injustice of of these entrenched systems and how much harder it makes for people to participate in things that we take consider for normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so so even connecting from the internet from Zambia is like very comp difficult simply because of such, yeah infrastructure yeah yeah infrastructure yeah is about economics and economics is about the world bank screwing the continent and um us taking raw resources and exploiting um <laughs> generations of rightful land owners um yeah i don't want to get on my soapbox but um well it in the worst possible case, we already we had Mokale until now, and uh, even this uh, event maybe it's it speaks a bit about the situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah and let's I'm... try to let's try to get him back in any yeah. case. I guess Shirley could could uh, could answer the things about let's say the relationship with European and African culture, right? I mean. Um... You can try me. I can also talk about the impact of COVID as I've seen it. Um... Sure. Let, let's talk about that a bit because uh, we don't we don't know much about that here, I guess. So how has uh, the COVID pandemic impacted the uh, musical life in, in South Africa? So I run Umkulo and we're, Umkulo, uh, we're an organization which, which makes music theater where by basically by bringing um, teams of people from Europe to, to share their skills with locals and to make productions with European funding uh, where we can reach people in their own communities. Um, and when COVID struck, um, I must say, I felt like a bomb exploded inside my head because I thought, how can I... How can I ask for funding to stage an opera uh, at a time where people 
are struggling for basic survival. And really, the, the initial problem in South Africa seemed to be doing so much better than Europe for a while with COVID. There were far fewer infections, it seemed. There was some speculation that, for instance, the fact that we South Africans mostly tend to be vaccinated against tuberculosis might be providing extra protection against the virus. We thought maybe it's because we have a younger population. Um, yeah, we, it, it seemed better, but the lockdown was the issue. Um, South Africa locked down early and hard. Um, and in a country with really minimal social security, that meant that millions of people lost their livelihoods. Um, losing your livelihood doesn't just mean having less disposable cash. It really literally meant having nothing to eat and being in danger of losing your home. Um, and all the music programs that we partner with began to run feeding schemes immediately instead of music schemes because they just responded to the most urgent needs as they saw them. Um, so what's a, what's a food scheme that... Foodie, it's basically a big soup kitchen. Um, my, my colleagues will appeal to supermarkets and to local communities for donations. They'll gather as much food as they can and they either or generally both put together food packages for households uh, or they make enormous pots of, of um, stews and- All right, so and it's a positive thing because I was thinking that it's some, some negative thing that people started making schemes. Ah, uh, no, to, to, to... no, it's, it's, it's an act of, of charity. Um, right, right, right. Yeah, some people just trying to help others survive. Um, and, you know, one of my most touching stories is uh, one of the singers from our productions who joined us in his mid high school years. He's an orphan and he told the story of his being an orphan as, as a central point of one of the productions that we made. Um, and he's still a young man with zero financial backing, no resources. Um, and, and he decided to fund, uh, to found a soup kitchen in his own community. And he just went round and talked to supermarkets and talked to taxi drivers and talked to teachers. And, uh, he got together a group of people and they, um, they distribute food in their local communities simply through tremendous initiative. Um, and when I lost funding and, and had a, a major crisis to survive um, just to cover our, our backdated costs as an organization, um, he made a donation of, of 10 euros, which I think is the most, it's the most generous gift anyone has given me, it, you know, at a time where I was filled with despair um th that gift gave me hope and he and his colleagues kept telling me your work is important we need the music we miss the music we need this to look forward to um i'm still stuck on the, the basic problem that if i go to south africa i can't come back to europe because of the variant there um and i worry that in bringing people together will kill them it's as basic as that right right um, and, and the choral scene, you know, for so many people singing together is, is existential in South Africa. It's the thing that, that brings them joy. It's the thing that brings them hope. And not being allowed to sing together, that's like, that's like cutting off a limb. It's, it's, it's disastrous. Um, not even beginning to talk about all the artists who've lost their livelihood um, with no bailout packages. There, there was one, but all the money has disappeared and nobody can quite say where. Um, it, it's, it's alarming. It's desperate. You know, we see people showing great generosity and great resilience and great initiative. And yet it's, it's dire. It's, it's a desperate situation. Um, and we, we, we need for this thing to be over. Uh, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine has been proven ineffective against the South African variation of the, of the virus. So they stopped the rollout of that. Right. Uh, and it's, it's a bigger tightrope walk. You know, do you lock down and stop people from being able to survive? Do you open up and you know, facilitate the, the spread of the virus? And, you know, what seemed at the moment like um, such a, a hopeful start to the virus we thought oh, it's not taking off in south africa is now south africa is at least as bad as the uk the official statistic is um is 40,000 but uh, the unofficial is is at least 100,000 deaths um and and rising um 
and uh, all the things we hope for younger population more resilience uh, have have been wiped out by by the cleverness of this virus can i can i ask like uh, this is also connected to the covid pandemic and the previous statement that uh, one of uh, you guys made about uh, buying instruments being expensive and getting access to tuition so just for our viewers to understand more or less like what are the kind of population gaps in terms of income like um, I mean there, I mean yeah there, 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 there are two men in South Africa Mr. Rupert and Mr. Oppenheimer who between them own as much as the poorest 50% of the population right so you know those charts you see um, globally of the gulf between the rich and the poor are even more exaggerated in South Africa and um, more than half of the population lives drastically below the poverty line. Um, just to say, you know, in theory, in democracy, now everyone has access to tertiary education. So anyone can go to university. The problem is to get into a bachelor course at uh, university, you need a level of basic literacy, which many of the community schools are still unable to provide. Um, so a lot of tertiary institutions have, in, have introduced, um, uh, says, I just saw Mokale there and get, got very yeah. <laughs> excited, but now, now he's gone again. I'm sure he will. Um, I'm just going to tell him, keep trying. Yeah. Um, but, but sorry, where were we? Um, yes, you were yes, de the describing uh, the, the access to the tertiary, uh, tertiary uh, education. Yeah, many universities have introduced bridging programs. Um, and of course, it's voice that people come to university music departments with. Um, and the talent is incredible. People's determination is remarkable. Um, but again, the system is struggling to keep up. For instance, in, in Grahamstown, um, the city with the with the festival they have last i heard they had 80 voice students and one pianist and then the pianist resigned <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> right it's 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 really hard to so to i mean i mean like i mean like the for example in germany or in finland when you when you talk about poor people you you talk about people who earn let's say i don't know uh, uh, 700 euros a month or something and and they still have a house and uh, and uh, you know they 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 can still buy cheap food or something and get by but below the poverty line in south africa i guess it means a vast numbers of people in south africa are living on less than 100 euros a month yeah so that's the below the poverty line now if you yeah. go to the supermarket in south africa you'll find groceries are not really cheaper than they are here right right um that means that they are living on starch um basically that they buy the cheapest cheapest food stuffs even potatoes have become beyond people's economic reach um so it's really? cornmeal that's made into a porridge um People will not eat three meals a day. It's very common to to only eat two or maybe one meal a day. Um, and the middle class is struggling too. Um, you know, there has been post-apartheid, there was a big boom on the sale of white goods. So we can see, okay, me, more people are, are now able to afford a washing machine or a refrigerator. Um, but it's not like in Europe where you have a broad middle class. Uh, it's still a um, small segment of the population and, and the, the bulk of the population is, is struggling below the poverty line. Yeah. So in that case, of course, it's, it's very hard to, to offer like any kind of hope for these people to, you know, let alone what, what studying music, but, you know, like getting basic, you know, uh, basic needs met. On the contrary, um, the one thing I find when I go into townships to work is hope. Um, and the one thing you'll find in, in vast quantities when you talk to young people in township schools is hope. Um, and you ask them what their dreams are and it's all about building a better future. If you ask a class of say 15 year olds, what do you wanna do? They'll say, I wanna be a doctor to improve the health of my community. I wanna be a social worker to help young people in trouble. Um, I wanna be a lawyer to fight for people's rights. 
projects. Um, the dream of a, of a better future is thriving out there. And the universities are packed with young black students who, who will transform the country. Mm. This is something that I think the Europeans should learn from. I, I, I mean that often people are really pessimistic here and only thinking of decline and everything. But I, I think if we get that spirit of looking towards the future with hope and with some kind of per perseverance, I think the future yeah. could be look better for, for the whole, whole world. Look, the hustle is is alive and well, and uh, you know, on on every you you halt your car at a traffic light, and and someone will be trying to sell you plastic coat hangers, and someone else will be trying to sell you cell phone chargers, and someone else will be making little pictures that they're trying to sell. And these are people who are getting out of bed at four in the morning, who are making a long journey on public transport, um, who are investing the tiny bit that they can scrape together in something that they can leverage uh, into something more um, and and this this spirit of of not giving up of determination of of creativity of striving is is it's it's the only thing sometimes that gives me hope because politics is a mess in South Africa um, social security is a mess corruption is out of control right um, I mean, I would say, like, compared to my, my country of Romania, because I, I did grow up there for five years in communism. And when people were very poor, very like you couldn't find food, even if you had money, you know. And uh, we, we grew up after the fall of communism with the hope that, you know, we're also going to become a industrialized Western country. Like, and we always looked up to France and Germany and all these places and uh, I think people did have a lot of hope for some years. And after the getting into the EU, and of course, some things have improved for sure. And, uh, but there's still very, very many poor people who, who live with less than 200 euros per month. And uh, I think most, I would say, if I check the society as I know it, and if I check on TV, I don't think people have much hope anymore. Be and I think it's mostly because of the corruption in, in the politics, because you realize that for whoever you vote, it's not going to change anything. And uh, all, all you hope is that some things, some things happen outside so that it forces the politicians in Romania to make changes. But can I dial Mokali in? Go ahead. Um, oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. 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 I'm to, uh... Hi, Macaulay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I well, can hear you. so let's let's continue the conversation with you this way. Is yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, I, I heard Shelley talking of of hope and despair uh, in the times of of Corona uh, virus, the pandemic, and and you know uh, political corruption. Just just a small point that uh, in terms of political corruption. Uh, it 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 does not, or it did not start with 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 COVID. I recall uh, it's something that we, that we have lived with since uh, uh, ninety four. You know, uh, the dawn of the, the democracy. I think you know the new government just inherited all the you know bad tendencies of the previous government. Um, if you remember, uh, there was a huge political scandal with uh, funds allocated for, for the 2010 World Cup. There was, yes. I don't know the, the, the figures, I can confirm that. They, they, they were, there were millions that were allocated for, for artists to be part of the celebration for the 2010 World Cup when South Africa hosted that. And um, the, 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 that never happened or the, the biggest chunk of that money was misappropriated. So there is that tendency, you know. They, uh, so it, do, it does not start with with, with the pandemic. It's that you know we have gotten used to to uh, our our you know uh, uh, bureaucrats and civil servants misappropriating funds that were you know meant for 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 artists. So it's just a continuation of of you know a practice that started some time back. Yeah, that's that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah, mm, I see. 
Let, tell us a bit about the East, uh, the, about the contemporary music scene in South Africa. I remember Nilo is the president of the IC. How is it? The uh, International Music Days in. The, the, no, I, it, of, yeah. I'm, I'm the president of the Finnish section of ISCM. Yes, and, and does, it, that, that doesn't mean ah. much actually. And I remember <laughs> that Nilo was telling me once that from Africa, the only countries that do send often the the proposals are South Africa and Egypt, I think, right? That's what you said, Nilo. Well, I, I don't remember exactly uh, what I have said, point, but let's, let's my, hear my what Mokala can was tell. performed in, in Slovenia by the Ljubljana Madrigalist. Okay. And uh, Nils, that's, now our paths are crossing because at some point I was the president of the South African chapter. <laughs> okay. So tell us a bit about the contemporary yeah. music scene in South Africa. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting space uh, in the sense that for me, it actually shows uh, fractures uh, or divisions within the classical, the so-called classical music. Uh, you have, you know, the, the, you know, the symphony orchestras and, and, and the opera companies uh, preferring to do the tried and tested. Um, then you have individuals, you know, very small organizations uh, struggling with, with, with funding, uh, you know, mounting performances or putting to, together performances for, for new music. And um, I've been, and some of my works have been largely in those, in those spaces. And, and it's an interesting one because you know, as I say, you know, uh, small, I'm, I really mean small, you know, where you might even have an audience of a hundred people. Uh, you know, you get used to that and uh, it's, it's an audience that would actually even engage you as, as a composer after a performance where, you know, you, you really, you know, explain how the composition process went. So it's, it's a, a, a divided, uh, you know, space where, very difficult to raise money for, for, for contemporary music. I've just completed a commission by, by the new orchestra of Washington what now, um, right. and I submitted it, I submitted it in, on the 31st of, of December. Uh, but guess what? I've never received a commission from any South African you know, uh, orchestra. Well, I, I guess it's because of uh, some of the things that I have for and some of the things that I have uh, said about our local orchestra and not recognizing and paying attention, particularly to, to, you know, to black composers. Um, I mean, we, we have people like Bongani Dotana Breen, Andile Kumalo, who uh, enjoy international recognition as, as composers but i know bongani uh, has actually made significant strides you know uh, and he has some work you know uh, he has done some work for if i'm not mistaken the kwazulu natal philharmonic but it's a very um, unfortunate you know a, a, a environment where a living composers who write in a particular style um you know get ignored or their music never gets performed and um with little efforts to 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 develop an audience on a on a on a bigger scale and but i guess that's a dynamic that is not necessarily unique to to south africa no, you know, no. i imagine that even in other parts of the world it it does happen yeah go ahead Shelley. go ahead i i would i would absolutely underline what um what Mokali has said in that, uh, you know, within a small struggling contemporary music scene, there is the problem of systemic racism. Um, and the CEO of the Cape Philharmonic Orchestra said last year, um, or the year before last, um, that there, it's a pity that there are no black symphonic composers. Um, and, and his comment led to the founding of, of an internet page from a Johannesburg composer, um, which is highlighting black South African composers um, because, because it's bullshit. There's plenty of black composers writing. Uh, they just are not getting a chance from the white establishment. And it's an old, old problem. 
Yeah, do, 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 you know, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to interrupt you, to, to Rochelle. You know, it, it, it gets a, a bit emotional when, when you know, uh, when you get into this space because the very CEO, you know, in, in 202011, when uh, I was in a controversy with the, with, with the Johannesburg Philharmonic Orchestra and we were in, uh, we were having a seminar on the exclusion of, of black composers. He was part of, of, of the, the participants. He openly committed that he, you know, he will offer me a commission to write for the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra. Guess what? A year or two later, he, he, he has never done that. Let's let's say that he he, he never you know, fulfilled that that promise. It was just an empty promise. Then a year or two later, uh, I was touring South Africa with with a, a men's chorus from 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 the U.S. And we needed, you know, the services of, of an orchestra. So I thought, well, since he once promised me that uh, he'll commission me, at least offering the services of his orchestra for free would, would do. No, he did not do that. They, they charged us. Well, anyway, there was a budget for that. But I, there is this hypocritical positioning by some of the, you know, the directors and CEOs of uh, orchestras. It's, like I said, you know, I have, I have a personal you know, experience of, of, of that, yeah. Makali is also someone who is not shy about speaking his opinion, and he's been at the center of some explosive controversies on the South African music scene. It, it's, you know, from a distance, it's uh, kind of entertaining to watch the fights and the feathers flying, but in a real sense, Makali is quite right. Those things have not endeared him to the conservative establishment. But I think it's really, really important that that Mokala is bringing this out because it's horrible that this kind of systematic racism is preventing new music to be heard and, and new composers to be um, f- getting further in their careers. So let, let me ask now, well, this is about the contemporary music scene, but uh, let's get a bit into the economic aspect. I, I think this is something I would like to ask. So whether it's contemporary or non-contemporary, how does classical music or, or Western music get funded there? And is there this kind of systemic racism involved in also how the funding goes? Like I want to make a project with my friends and we want to organize a festival. Uh, where do we get money for that? Or I want to make a project with uh, an opera production and uh, where, where does the money come from? How, how does it work? Let's start with Mokale. Well, um, the, the, we, we have what is called the, the National Arts Council, uh, which is yet another body that, that, that is problematic. You know, uh, the National Arts Council has funding for orchestras, and that funding, the, the history of that funding can be traced from uh, the old... I think it was called the yeah there was there was an old during apartheid time there was an old there was a fund that was set aside for for commissioning composers and supporting the the, the national arts council that money was reinvested and it's still reinvested uh, for the use by orchestras you know uh, the, the the symphony orchestras so they uh, they they get several millions you know to run the you know the the the, the orchestra. Uh, so they find it easy, but if you were to put a a, a production uh, and you need you know orchestras in, uh, an orchestra to 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 play uh, to accompany your production, it be it be it an opera or an oratorio, uh, you'd still have to pay for the services of those orchestras. Yet the the taxpayer is 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 funding those you know the salaries and administration of of those orchestras. You know it's a double edged sword. You struggle to raise money for your own production. So the National Arts Council is currently embroiled in controversies, you know, regarding mismanagement of, of funds. As we speak, you know, their CEO is, is um, you know, uh, and the CFO, Chief Financial you know, Officer. So the it, it, it's a polluted space when it comes to funding. Yeah, um, quite, quite frustrating, I must say. Yeah. There's also, so you can apply to the NAC, the National Arts Council. You can also apply to Lotto. Um, They have generous amounts of funding, but 
once again, the, the allocation of funds and the process is mired in, in controversy. What tends to happen is that you apply to Lotto, you don't hear anything for three years, then they say you've got your funding, but they never actually give you the money. Um, uh, for three years? What? Yeah. yeah. That's, I have never yeah. heard about any a funding process that long. Wow. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's not supposed to be three years, it just is. Um, and, and who knows what happens with the money in between. So first of all, so for example, I apply with a project today and I'm hoping for the answer in three months, but instead the answer comes in three years and I might still not get the money, yes. right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and this Unbelievable. happens well, again and again. I'm laughing, but it's not funny actually. Yeah. And then um, yeah. people try to raise uh, money privately. Uh, a lot of musicians end up doing these horrible corporate gigs where you put on a bow tie and go and sing bleeding chunks of operas for, for bankers and financiers. Um, and there, you know, there's some money in that, but it's very hard to, to survive doing that. Then the big banks like FNB is a bank that gives money to the choral competitions. And again, that's um, ground to a halt, I believe, in recent years, Makali. Yeah, it's it's look the the, the the cultural scene is is as I said it's a double edged sword. You know you you get corruption from 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 uh, you know state funding via the you know the National Arts Council. Uh, they also have provincial offices and provincial arts councils. You know you have to be politically connected. That's the other thing. You have to be politically connected. You have to speak the language. Of, of the politicians' popular language uh, to have access to funding. With corporate, uh, corporate they, they dictate what they want. Rarely um, you, you, you'll find you know, a corporate sponsor who would believe in something that is unique. Uh, it does happen, but, you know, uh, but it, it rarely you know, it happens. To, to be honest, I have received funding from, from a businessman who, you know, uh, believed in a project that, that, that I was doing, but those are rare cases, you know, those are rare cases. So, um, yeah, it's a real struggle. The, the other thing is, um, even within, within the corporate sector, you know, you have to be connected to somebody, you have to know somebody. And, and so, you know, the, the, those who, if they can survive, are, you know, to get an academic post um, is, is helpful for survival. A lot yeah. of I was I was going to ask about that. Isn't it like then the best case scenario for everybody to get, just get involved in the few institutions that exist, like the few orchestras or universities, or to get a job there and kind of like forget the freelancing and forget the uh, struggles? Yeah, that's where I find myself. Uh, I'm, I'm in an academic, you know, uh, post. At least I do not have to worry about my income, I'm able to, to compose uh, what I like. And um, even if commissions come uh, once in two years or so, uh, but at least I have an income. I don't have to worry about uh, having to put food on the table. I, I, I have been associated with you know, uh, two universities in South Africa. Yeah, that is a safe, of me not to mention the churches um, in, in this context. Um, Mokali is teaching at a university of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and it was at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Soweto that we were able to perform the St. John's Passion um, and a, a wonderful opportunity for us to really dock into the local community. Um, and the new apostolic church is I think the second biggest music educator in South Africa. Um, you know, even in Zambia, 
actually is the premier, the best, the best students I have in my department uh, from the New Apostolic Church. Right. Um, and that, that's huge. Like, for instance, when we needed timpani, when we did the Fairy Queen in Cape Town, we were able to borrow them from the New Apostolic Church. They have orchestras, they have bands, they have choirs. Um, it's, it's really impressive. They are out there doing the work um, that the government should be doing. Mm. This yeah. is actually interesting. Could I ask uh, just, I mean, it was in my plan to ask also about Zambia a bit, like uh, uh, since you are there, Mokale, I mean, uh, I wasn't ever hoping that I would ever talk to someone from Zambia about, uh, you know, music there. So how is it where you teach? Is, uh, can anybody study Western music there or is, is there like other kind of music much more popular and what's the big picture, let's say? It's interesting. Every music student in Zambia wants to do the ABRSM, the Associated Board uh, of the Royal Schools of Music. Right. Uh, like I said, the 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 you know Apostolic Church, the New Apostolic Church, is the premier uh, music educator in in this country. And um, the now something quite unique. You know, I said that our, our, our university is based in, in a rural area. Uh, now, a number of these rural areas in Zambia, where you have the new apostolic church, you would find what they would call a, 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 an orchestra. It would be a bunch of musicians, perhaps three violinists, one cello, a, flu, a flautist, and, you know, they group together. In rural spaces, I have actually found that to be very, very, very interesting. The local, I mean, the government, uh, the education department has not seen the value of, of working with, with this church to, 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 to further improve music education. Yeah, the, it, it, it's a very you know, interesting space. So there is a lot of classical music in, in this country. In, you know, here at the university, we have just uh, instituted you know, uh, weekly recitals. On Sunday evening, we have recitals. Uh, the past week, you know, we are doing a, an, an all Mozart project, a, a, a program. And uh, two weeks, three weeks ago, we did an all Bach program, but it's still at elementary level, still at elementary level. And um, but I'm I'm hoping, you know, we, within within a, a period of time, you know, I know that the 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 you know, the, you know, the the standard will definitely you know uh, uh, improve. Well. So, a lot of classical music, uh, but on the other hand, I have been to an indigenous festival, which was quite exciting, uh, uh, which is not highly promoted, you know, you know, uh, you know in the country. So, um, but it's, it's quite an interesting space. You know, because like the the guest we had from Ghana said that if if uh, you would get some uh, piano recital. Uh, or I don't know, some string quartet playing, I don't know, some Chopin and uh, Beethoven and something like that. People just won't come much because it's not so popular. I mean, he might go because he studies music, but can you get, let's say, an audience to these events in Zambia? Do you have an audience that wants to hear Mozart and uh, Bach and so on? Well, uh, I am based in, in a, a, a rural town. Uh, and a university, so there's a captive audience, but they, uh, but they not necessarily for classical music, but we are building it. But in Lusaka, there are, you know, I'm, I'm working with a friend, uh, Theo Bros, who is German, but does a lot of work here in, in, in Zambia. The, you know, he has a company called Promenade, and they do events, you know, uh, which are very highly supported by you know, lo lo local. Now, I think the, the, the one factor that you need to take into account is the, the, the diplomatic community and the immigrant you know, community. They, uh, they are the ones who, who support and patronize these, these events. So um, I think it might be different from other, 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 you know, other countries, or there might be some similarities with other countries. You know. This is interesting because always, also in the episode we, we were uh, discussing about Ghana situation 
uh, the the these embassies got got mentioned. So it's it's an inter interesting factor to the music life. I would be interested in um, in hearing something about the relationship between uh, the indigenous music and then um, of the church music or the classical music. Is, is it that, that same people attend to both uh, kind of events or are they more separate from each other? Yeah, in, in indigenous uh, would largely be patronized by a lot of you know uh, tourists. Then the the um, the church has its own audience, and even the programming is different. Obviously, it would be it would obviously be sacred music after the performance of, of, of sacred music, but sure. you have uh, crossovers in terms of audiences. Some within that you know the from 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 the church audience would also go to uh, performances organized by promenade for instance the, you know the diplomatic co you know, community yeah so there there the, the, there's the, the, there are crossovers even in, in terms of audiences but for indigenous performances the one that i went to it was largely you know a, a, a tourist and, and a lot of locals, you know, because it was a, a, an event, it, it's an annual event around June, uh, where they, they, you know, the, the, the local chief comes and, you know, talk and they even pray for rain and, and all that. It's highly patronized, yeah. So tourism is also, also a factor to point out. And maybe I, I can grab a moment to just describe a choral festival that I went to. Sure. Um, you mean in South Africa now? So yeah, we, yeah. Not, not in Zambia. Okay. Yeah. The first um, <clears throat> national choir festival, high school choir festival event that I went to, I only had the address on a piece of paper. Um, and it was the dome, which Macaulay mentioned earlier, the dome in Johannesburg. And I, I yes. was on late. I was stressed in the traffic. I, I finally got there and I thought, oh no, you know, stupid me. I only got the name of the building. I didn't ask which room or which floor or anything this competition is happening in. Um, so I thought, well, I'll just go and ask. And I went there and I discovered it was a, it was a vast stadium that seated 6,000 people. And it was wow. jam packed with high school choir singers. Um, and I walked into this packed stadium. Um, and the section that I walked in on was um, the boys' section of the high school choirs were doing the Pilgrim's Chorus from Tannhäuser. And, um, and the audience was the, honestly the only place I've been which was comparable was Pesaro, the Rossini Opera Festival in Pesaro, which had some events in the Parla Festival, a big sports stadium, and and this special Italian opera audience, um, they have a passionate connection with the music and with the singers, um, and when a singer does particularly well, you feel it in the audience in Italy. Um, and it was the same in, in Johannesburg, in this building. Um, if after that they moved on to solo and ensemble, they had the quartet from Cosi Fantute. They had tenors were doing an aria from Ascanio and Alba. Um, insane repertoire, you know, um, absolutely crazy. And you got the feeling that every learner in the audience knew every note of what was being sung. And you had this collective sense of participation and then so if a tenor hits a good high note um the whole the whole lot of them would be on their feet cheering um you know and if someone hit a wrong note you hear this collective intake of breath of six thousand engrossed high schoolers um honestly i i was staggered when i saw that and it helped me to understand a little bit better where all these amazing voices are coming from in, in South Africa. And I, I said to one of the organizers, I cannot believe this while 6,000 kids are all together singing opera. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a problem. You know, it's a small venue. Um, we've, we've had to stagger them because actually we have 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> small. <laughs> well, I was, I was already thinking that maybe we have different definitions of small when earlier on, Mokale was 
uh, referring to small audiences having uh, only 100, 100 people me yeah. me members audience I was thinking like well I'm kind of happy if if I have a premiere and there is 30 people in the audience so wow 100 well that's kind of nice and well but if there is like 6,000 uh, choristers singing together in an in an arena that's kind of wow I mean, they would never had like, they are they are though for Kosifan Tute, bro, not for your premiere. So well, that's sure. But you know, yeah, I, I mean, maybe something si only similar thing that comes to my mind is maybe the the Estonian singing festival. Yeah, I mean, there are like kind of thousands of people singing, but they're not really singing together. So they're mostly there to okay. listen to other to, to to the other choirs. Um, where they will sing together is in a kind of spontaneous. Um, I found if they were or if they were inspired by something they heard, they'd get to their feet and start singing in four parts as a kind of applause. Wow, uh, okay. It, it, but it, they are kind of alternating in, in, in who is listening and who is singing. Yes, yes, it's a, it's okay. a choir competition. So generally speaking, it's one choir after another. Yeah. And, and But there's this feeling of Ubuntu. It's a wonderful South African word meaning um, your sorrow is my sorrow, my joy is your joy. It's it's a collectivity, and you really feel this from the collective for the collective. And I just want to stress those ten thousand participants that I was there. They were only the finalists. They were the, the 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 select few who had won the cherished prize of the final final competition in Johannesburg, and that was the tip of the iceberg. Um, it, so that's it, huge. It Huge is scene. massive, and the repertoire is, you know, that's the high school competition. Then there's various adult competitions. Um, one that I was involved in, they were singing, they now do whole scenes. So they were doing um, a large section of Don Carlos by Verdi, and and one of the baritone soloists fainted on stage. Here's Macaulay. Okay. Um, have I got you, Macaulay? So Macaulay's connection got lost again previously. Now he's going to come back, but there is going to be a lot of sound coming from outside. So I hope everyone can stand up the heat and listen until the end. There's going to be a couple of uncomfortable parts, but all in all, it's pretty understandable. Have I got you, Macaulay? Yeah, I can do it. It's much better. Okay, I'm, I'm just filling the guys in on these um, on the um, National Choral at Stedfords. And I was telling, I was at an FNB finals one day, oh. and, um, and they were doing Don Carlo, and the, the baritone the, the fainted on stage in the final scene. It was just yeah. enormous to do, and they, they carried him off. Um, and there was this kind of, do we have a Philip in the house? And of course, someone in the audience leapt to his feet and said, yes, yes, I can sing Philip. And he jumped onto the stage <laughs> and, <laughs> and sang. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Can I say one thing? Like my takeaway from what you were saying, Shirley, and uh, tell me if I'm wrong about this. So there is a lot of people who would, there is a lot of space potentially for people who are interested in such music. There is uh, a lot of talent going on. If only there was, let's say, more will and more funding. Yeah, and and as Mokali says, you know, a little bit more expertise in the in the selection committees would certainly help. Sure. Um, but but in, that was also a long-winded answer to your question about participation. Um, opera um, attracts these vast numbers of people who are all singing it themselves. It's not just the thing of, I'm going to sit there and, and, and listen to these people somewhere else do it. It's like, um, you, you know, you would, I would say most petrol stations you go to to fill up your car, you can ask the guy, are you a tenor or a baritone or a bass? And he'll probably be able to sing you something by Mozart or Rossini. You know, it's it's the, the popularity wow. of, of choral singing. Um, so how did all this actually start? How, how 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 did how, how did you end up to the situation where 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 opera is really so popular? Sure, Shirley, you, you're the opera critic, so maybe we start yeah, with you. I mean, it, it, it was it happened through these competitions. The okay. competitions were uh, have existed for a long time and were very well organized nationally, um, and um, it 
it, from my point of view, it began partly with the introduction of operatic repertoire to the set repertoire for these choral competitions. Um, the story that you will hear in Cape Town is that um, Angelo Gabato, um, the, the uh, director of Cape Town Opera, was one of the key people in doing that. Um, I'm hoping, uh, I think we just lost Makali, unfortunately. Um, that's a one-sided story. It was certainly not only white people um, bringing opera into black competitions. There were also some historical um, key figures, uh, com senior black composers um, and, and pedagogues who were very instrumental in, in bringing opera to the, to the black community. Oops, here comes Makali. Sorry, Makali, have we got you again? Yeah, network is, is doing me a great disservice to the, today. And, uh, I just, um, I wonder if you could help me out on who, who, the, who the central figures were in, in bringing opera repertoire to the choral scene. No, 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 no. That actually started with the, uh, the visit of the three tenors. Ah, Pavarotti, Carreras, Domingo. Yeah, Pavarotti, Placido, Domingo, and uh, is it Carreras? Yeah. Yes, yes. And I, okay. I, I also attended the, their performance at the Union Building. That from then onwards, the, the opera bug beat the, the South African audience. Yeah, uh, you know, one, one can trace it from, from, from then onwards. Because, you know, previously, we had the, uh, the, 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 the national uh, uh, arts, you know, uh, provincial arts companies, you know, uh, presenting operas, for instance, NAPEC, uh, which was in Natal, uh, you know, PECT, which was uh, uh, the Transvaal one, and, and uh, Parkoffs, and, and all that. They used to have opera you know, productions, but not on a regular basis. But it was not as big as it is right now. Uh, it was only after you know the the, um, the visit of, of the three tenors. So what year was that, more or less? Italia, you know, the, uh, when Italy hosted you know World Cup. Okay, 1990. 1990. Oh my goodness, the bug beat the South African you know, a music audience. Um, but then I, I can't um, tell how it got into schools uh, because that's where it is big, you know, the, the, the prescription of, of opera in schools, which is an unfortunate thing on the other end, particularly from a developmental point of view, because only a few uh, children have actually made strides in, in the area. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the fact that, you know, we have a lot of, 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 of opera singers emerging from that scene. So another double-edged sword. Uh, it's proper development. If government funded, you know, a, a, a proper music education program, uh, because at the moment, uh, most of the music education program that produces opera singers, is via the Eisted Ford. So the Eisted Ford is only a, 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 a funnel that conveys, you know, it's a conveyor belt for what happens in, in uh, what should be happening in schools. But what is happening in schools is not proper music education. It's just kids having an opportunity to sing. That's the only, you know, active uh, uh, music activity that happens, you know, but it's not... I mean, most most of the opera singers uh, uh, or those who claim to be opera singers uh, at the lower level, uh, but in, in terms of standards, but, but are, are professional and they are reading and uh, at times, you know, a, a musicianship is questionable. I mean, I've, I've had a situation where one of my commissioned works got messed up by, by two prominent uh, uh, singers <laughs> <laughs> because of their reading ability and they did not learn the music on time, their sight reading was bad, you know. So you you will have a, a situation where you have these, you know, renowned artists, but when you check their renowned singers, but when you check their musicianship and, 
you know, a, a, a side reading, the musicianship, broadly speaking, side reading and, and, and other aspects of, of, of training. Uh, it's, 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 it's quite dubious, you know. Um, for me, that, therein lies, you know, the problem with, 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 with how opera is seen as a vehicle for, for training young singers. Yeah, and I, I would just underscore that by saying, um, although you have hundreds of thousands of school, school students singing opera, they're learning by ear. Um, and they learn by copying CDs. Um, there's loads of, of yes, pirated, yes. pirated CDs. I'll get a pirated CD. They'll have a ghetto blaster in the classroom. And you'll have these 13-year-olds yeah. trying to sound like Maria Callas. So it's oh, a yeah. game. Um, okay. They're yeah. not being, so it's a, they're not it's a very one-sided uh, method and doesn't really help with the uh, overall musicality. I think it helps, but it's not as it's not as empowering as it could be if it were partnered with music literacy and um, and thorough yeah. theoretical education. You know, Makali is yeah. a, is but, a, but, 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 yeah. Somebody once said to me, kids in in, in rural areas uh, and some of the disadvantaged communities, they see a few who have had the opportunity of being in singing, imitating the Pavarotti's and all that. And they would say, you have a situation of kids imitating the imitators. You know, <laughs> uh, there are those who are in prominence, uh, imitate your, your renowned you know, Pavarotti's, Carreras and, and all that. Then the younger ones who see them, they imitate, you know, a typical situation of imitating the, you know, the imitators. And I found that quite, not necessarily amusing, but quite sad. But, you know, I, at, at first I laughed. But after reflecting on that, I, I actually said, no, that, that, that is a very unfortunate, you know, situation. And it's, it's in some ways um, exacerbated by the, the Pretty Yenders and uh, the Pumeza Machikizas. You know, there are these young South African singers who've seriously hit the, hit the big time internationally. Um, and it's a kind oh, of a, a, a Cinderella uh, thing. So, you know, each, each, oh, yeah. each yeah. teenage township girl sees herself in Pretty Yender and thinks she has a voice, I have a voice too. You know, maybe if I just sing, <laughs> if I sing a bit louder, um, maybe I can get rich too. Um, oh, okay. Right. Uh, that's oversimplifying. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a, again, a double-edged sword, as, as Makali keeps saying. All right, but... Well, that's fine. Despite of all the internet troubles and all the, uh, all the, I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, we we still I think managed to cover a lot of ground, and uh, I hope uh, our audience, as small as it is, will get to learn more about South Africa and Zambia, and uh, understand a bit yeah. the situ the situation in in such places. Go ahead, Mokale. No, 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 no. I, I was just saying that you know, I just wanted to, to to thank you guys. Thank you, Shelley. You know, for you know for the opportunity. It, you know, it's interesting that yesterday I had an interview with with Bongan and ah. uh, about yeah, you know, similar you know things, and it looks like uh, things are good. I, 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 you know, people are beginning to to pay attention to the plight of of musicians and um, you know in, in musicians composers uh, you, know, in, you know in the country um, and um, you know to you uh, uh, Marty and, and, and Nilo uh, I really appreciate you know uh, the fact that you you have interest in in what is happening in both my you know can, my home country and my adopted country yeah you know thanks for that guys well, I mean, the whole point of our podcast was w when we started this, we were thinking like now it's COVID times. Now it's like uh, we, we need we want to do something that feels meaningful. So I think that the the end question of our podcast, like the, the last thing we always put is the wh what uh, is the place for contemporary music and classical music in today's society? So I think we just try to bring people together, see different perspectives from different places and uh, find out how our field as a whole, which we all love, I, I suppose, can, can have a better future and survive, especially now that we have been tried very hard by the COVID pandemic. 
So, yes, I want to also thank you, Mokale and, and Shirley, of, of providing really many interesting insights. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. And I would like to uh, thank you, Nina and Matai, for um, coming from Finland in order to finally bring me together with Mokali in Zambia. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. um, Ha wanting to have yeah. for a long time yeah. and and Mokali, I just really hope we can work again together soon. Yeah, do, do you know, Dylan, but I, I, I want to put a, a Shelly on the spot and say that, uh, um, you know, some of the activities done by Umkulo should be activated here in Zambia. Ha, 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 ha. Ah, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you sort out the pandemic and we'll be on the next plane. <laughs> Oh, okay, I, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I thought I thought the way you wanted to put Shirley uh, on was to to say that she has to uh, commission us like uh, two op two operas each for the opera company. <laughs> but another time, another. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah, All right. What you wish for, today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but thank you very much, everybody. This was Matej Georgiou and Nilo Tarnan and, and Shirley uh, Apthorpe and uh, Mokale Koapeng. Uh, tune into Key Culture again and uh, have a great day, everybody. All right, bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. All right, bye. -bye. Uh, all right. bye, -bye.